The speaker that we're going to be introducing next is one of my colleagues at the Center for Effective Altruism, uh, Seb Farquhar. He's the co-founder of the Global Priorities Project and formerly worked as a consultant at McKinsey and has worked in many other capacities with the effective altruism movement for many years. Uh, the question that we're going to be addressing uh, should EA's do policy is sort of a new and exciting topic finally coming to the stage in the effective altruism movement, where for so long we've focused on philanthropy and donations and uh, other forms of career choice that are perhaps more typical for people who are looking to do good. So uh, it's very exciting that the work that he and the rest of the Global Priorities Project team have been doing to try to figure out how, if in any way, we should be engaging with policy. And uh, with that, I'd like to invite you to the stage. Um, if you have questions throughout the talk, I'd like you to enter them on your phone. There is a link right here where you could submit Q&A questions, and he'll be taking them afterwards. So go ahead and take the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a, a real pleasure to be here and to speak with you all about policy and effective altruism. The, the title of the talk is, is Should Effective Altruists Do Policy? And you might be able to guess from the fact that, that I do, um, that I've come to the answer, yes. A and, and I will come to that conclusion, but I want to do that in a, in a slightly tentative way, carefully, considering the possible reasons why one might not want to do policy, why it might be bad for the effective altruism movement to do this stuff, and to think really carefully about the lessons that we can learn from the potential arguments for why we might not want to do it. Um, but ultimately, I think that it's a really exciting area, a really exciting field, and there's so much that can be done through policy and governance to make the world a better place that we'd be fools to ignore it as an area entirely. Um, so loosely, the structure of my talk is that I'm going to begin by making the sort of the case for why we should not ignore the area. Uh, then I'm going to look at the best reasons I can think of for why we might want to still hold back and not engage in policy, even though it's such a promising area, and think a little bit about what we can learn from those things. So by way of introduction, why I'm sort of interested in or talking about this uh, issue, I work at the Center for Effective Altruism on effective altruist policy. So thinking about what it is that effective altruism has to say, if anything, about policy and politics that's different to what the rest of the world has already been saying. Um, I came to the Center for Effective Altruism to establish the Global Priorities Project, which has been working on issues on, for example, research policy, research funding policy, working out how policymakers should weigh up quite different kinds of um, goods. So, for example, work in education versus work in health, how you even start doing something like that, um, and thinking about existential risk policy as sort of a, a particular focus area. Before that, I worked at McKinsey as a consultant, where I mostly worked on health and social care issues and did quite a lot of work with uh, public sector clients there. And that's left me with a, a strong interest in policy, and you might say a strong bias in favor of thinking that policy is a good thing to do. And I'm very aware of the potential that there's a bias there. So in the Q&A, I'd love to hear from people who, you know, might think that either I've gone far enough or not gone far enough in questioning those biases, uh, because I'm definitely open to changing my mind on this stuff. Um, but the reason that I think that policy is potentially incredibly exciting is largely because of the scale. Um, so the amount of money, the huge size of the resources that are allocated by governments um, is mind-boggling, really, really hard to wrap your head around. And so I'm going to start with a little framing exercise to help us realize how enormous this pot of money is, and also focused on many of the things that effective altruists care about the most. So making people better off, helping people, um, trying to do good things for communities and societies is what government is about, and it's also what effective altruists care about. And we should expect a big overlap there. And so if there's a lot of money being spent on things that we care about a lot, um, it would be a little bit surprising if we didn't want to engage with it. And then we had this extra fact that uh, government decision making and policy decision making is often quite centralized, which means that you only need to bring a message to a relatively small number of people um, in order to 
create big change. So I think that, that makes it a really exciting opportunity, and I'll walk through sort of some, some framing exercises to help get our heads around that. So first I want to, to draw your attention to, I think, one of the biggest success stories of the effective altruist movement so far, which is GiveWell. Um, and they've done incredible work, almost you know, hard to imagine how huge the amount of money they've moved is. I think in 2015, they estimated that they moved well over $100 million to the world's most cost-effective charities. And this is mind-blowing. It's not something that I would have regarded as possible five years ago. Uh, and just should make everyone step back and think, wow, $100 million a year from a team of something like 20 people um, sitting in some office there is, is, is staggering. And yet, if we compare it to sort of the, the greater scope of things, it's not necessarily a huge flow of resources in development. So the Gates Foundation moves uh, well over an order of magnitude more every year. Um, they've been around for longer and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's this huge alternative flow, and this is still looking at just private organizations. And then we think, stepping a little further out, let's start including some of these big government organizations that are engaged in, in aid, and we're looking at almost an order of magnitude again, more money flowing through these things every year. So that the entire pool of money moved by GiveWell, which is already an amount of money that we probably shouldn't have assumed was conceivable for a movement to be moving um, five years ago, ten years ago, is dwarfed in comparison to the amount of money that's being moved by these organizations. We're talking about a factor of 100 difference. And what that hints at, although it doesn't mean, um, is that it might be the case that working to improve the quality of the allocation of those resources might be 100 times more effective than uh, working on improving the GiveWell recommendations. Now, I say it only hints this and doesn't mean it because it, it doesn't mean it at all. Um, it might be easier or harder to change people's mind at GiveWell relative to at DFID. Uh, the quality of their existing recommendations is different and the processes are different. Um, they're growing at different rates. You definitely can't read off of this anything sharp. But it's, I think, just a useful thought exercise to get yourself in the frame of mind of realizing how much bigger the stakes are here, uh, which potentially makes it very attractive. And of course, we care about more than just aid. And there are bigger flows of resources than just aid. And if we expand this graph again a little bit to look at all of US federal spending, and this is just federal, not, you know, not state or local, um, you, know, you can't even see any of the other numbers anymore because this is just a completely different ballgame, completely different scale of the sorts of resources being allocated, just mind-blowingly different. And I think this doesn't entail that we need to be looking at this area, but it does raise some serious questions if we're not going to look at this stuff we need some really, really good reasons. And I think that's even stronger because of how centralized this decision making is. So um, we heard earlier today on the, in the careers panel about the sorts of decisions that governments make all the time and how about, you know, it, people in the room know some of these decisions, really important decisions, come down to what three or four people around a table end up feeling is the right choice. And if we have the opportunity to shape the information that these people have about what the best options are, about what the available alternatives might be to the policies that they were planning to do in the first place, um, this can have a huge effect. Now, I'm going to present a set of really bad models on the next slide. And I'm going to say that before I even show the slide, because it's so easy to pick holes in these models, that I don't want people to start doing it, because I don't mean anything uh, particularly robust behind this stuff. But if you do the ridiculously naive strategy of saying, OK, let's look at the amount of money that, say, the US Congress has authority over, um, and divide it by the number of people there, you get a ludicrous number of the sort of naive amount of authority each of them might have in monetary terms. Now, this is, is a terrible model. Uh, it is definitely not the case that any one rep uh, representative has $7 billion worth of authority because obviously they're representing tons of other stakeholders, their choices are limited by the, the constituents that they have, and so on and so forth. But even if we discount a ton for that, it's very clear that these people are influential at a scale that uh, is hard to imagine. Because if we try to do this, this process again of thinking about how big 7 billion actually is compared to um, 
sort of total money move by GiveWell. It's the sort of difference in numbers that human brains basically can't handle. Um, and so we should expect to underestimate the value of this kind of engagement and this kind of influence. And I look also at sort of a more specific example of an organization with a smaller scope, DFID, so this is the UK's Department for International Development. All I've done here is very simply counted the number of senior staff that they have, sort of people in pay grades above a certain level, um, and divided their budget by it. Now I think this is, again, it is an overestimate of the amount of decision-making power that these guys have, but not a huge overestimate. Um, you know, I think if one senior management individual who say, you know, these people, for example, might run DFID's work in a country, um, decide that one thing is a priority rather than another thing, they do have quite a lot of authority to change uh, the priorities of their program spending. Um, and maybe on that order of magnitude, 200 million. So this is a huge number, uh, probably an overestimate, but a huge number that should give us some pause. So I think this is why it's exciting, um, because the, the stakes are huge, and because the decisions are quite centralized, which means that your leverage, for lack of a better word, in persuading individuals is very high. But I think there are some reasons to avoid um, working in policy, and some of them are very good. And I have four of them on the slide. Sorry about that formatting. Um, I think these are reasonable hypotheses, and I think all of them have something to them. And I'm gonna go through each of them in turn and talk about what I think they have to them that's important to take seriously and what the lessons we should draw from those are. Uh, one is that it is hard to pick good policies. I think even people who believe this um, don't realize how true it is. It's incredibly true. Uh, one is the hypothesis that policy change is intractable. I think this is slightly less true, but it's still very important. One which I don't hear a lot from effective altruists, but I do hear a lot from policymakers, is that they're basically already proto-effective altruists. So by and large, they're trying to make the world a better place, and they're trying to do it using evidence and analysis, and where they're not living up to their ideals, it's because of realistic constraints about what's feasible and you can't change all that much by going in there gung-ho with an effective altruist mindset. I think, again, there's something to this, too, because a lot of policymakers are just great people doing a good job. Um, but again, I think we can look past it a little bit. And then last, I think there is a realistic concern that engaging in politics, which I try to distinguish from policy, and I'll talk more about that in a bit, might be bad for effective altruism. So I'll, I'll rattle through each of these in turn. I've got to say, they're each deep issues, and I could probably give a talk about any one of them. Um, and so there will be time in Q&A or afterwards to talk about them more. Um, I'm also ignoring some things that I think are also significant issues, but not quite at this level. I'm also explicitly not talking about whether specific EA people should do policy. That, I think, is a different question completely. And I'm not talking about whether specific EAs should donate to support uh, policy organizations. That, again, is a different question. I'm just thinking about whether or not EA as a movement should be engaged in the policy world. And I think what we get out of those four considerations, I'm just gonna flag them here and I'll come back to them again at the end, are three maxims about which I am uncertain, see maxim one, uh, but which I think are probably the right way to pursue policy, although they each have counter arguments and could be discussed. Uh, one is to be uncertain. I think it's really important not to overstate our evidence on which policies might be good or bad, and to be aware that basically most people who think that they know what the right policies are are wrong to be as confident as they are about them. Uh, one is to not be political, so I think we should be focusing on policy change as opposed to becoming part of a political movement. Uh, and I think we need to play to EA comparative advantage. So work out what it is that we're actually bringing to the table and not just assuming that policymakers are not doing a good job or something like this. Because I think that that's very far from the truth and will make bad progress if we just assume uh, something like that. So let's go through these each in turn. Hard to pick good policies. This is true. It's really hard to pick good policies. One piece of evidence for this is that's very smart very well-informed, very well-intentioned people disagree about policies. They cannot all be right, so some of them are wrong. 
So if all you know about yourself is that you are a very smart, very well-intentioned, uh, very well-informed person, it still isn't enough to conclude that the things that you think are true about policy are true. Uh, this is really hard to remind yourself of, and you need to remind yourself of it a lot, because I think it would be very damaging to go around being extremely confident about which policies are good and bad, and accidentally push for policies that are bad. Um, now, I think that it's possible to take this sort of epistemic virtue too far because the policy world is sufficiently complicated that you can never rule out that there might be a negative unintended consequence to something you're proposing. And we need to work with that because there is no, there's no sort of null choice. We can't opt not to pick a policy because the status quo is a choice. Um, and that means that you know, all of our reasons to be cautious and uncertain apply there too. Um, but I think we can also sometimes be more confident than other times. And I find really neat, although not definitive, uh, this survey of economic experts. So what they do is they send out, you know, they have a panel of economic experts with sort of significant credentials in the field, and they send them out questions on a regular basis and ask them what they think about important issues that face society. And you often find two different kinds of graphs, and I've shown uh, an example of each of those on this screen. Uh, so the graph on your left um, shows sort of a, a live topical issue. What is the impact of a $15 minimum wage on low-income unemployment rates uh, with some extra caveats? And you take a quick look at the chart, and it's very obvious that uh, people who at least have some credibility in answering this question do not agree on what the answer is. And what this suggests is that unless you have a special reason to think that you know more about this system than these experts, which you might, but unless you think you have a special reason, you probably shouldn't be pushing hard policies resting on the assumption of a particular outcome from a minimum wage on employment levels. Now, you may have views for or against that policy that are based on other things about which you might be more confident, but on if they're based on this particular reason, you might not want to be super confident about it. On the other hand, you look at this other chart of whether basically Brexit is good or bad for people's well-being in Britain, and it's very clear that basically all experts, you know, not actually all, but there's a strong consensus that Brexit will prove bad for income. And then I think you can start to make some more robust claims. So to sum up my take of this idea that it's hard to pick good policies, I think it's like, yes, it is extremely hard. And 90% of the time when I investigate a policy, I find out that it is worse than I originally thought it was. Um, and usually that it's sufficiently worse that I'm not going to touch it again or do anything more on it, even when it initially seems incredibly attractive. Um, and that's sad, but that's just a reality that I think people need to be okay with if they want to do policy work and not end up recommending stuff that's bad. Um, and that's you know, regrettable, but is just part of doing responsible policy work. And you can, it's a, there's a workaround. Um, then let's look at the second issue, which is the tractability of policy change. And I hear from a number of people that they think that policy change might be intractable relative to other potential EA causes. And I think there's a lot, people come at this with very different intuitions. And there are a lot of different things people might mean by it. I think one thing that goes on is, you know, we, we go back to this huge, um, this huge number, and people are thinking changing the distribution of that enormous number significantly is really hard. And that's true, but it's such a big number that even if you're only changing the distribution of a tiny part of it, you're actually still, like, the tractability there starts to look way better. So I think often people's sense of the intractability comes from being like a small fish in a big pond, um, but the relative sizes mean that that intuition isn't very reliable. But there are some other things going on here too. Some people think that policymaking processes are just like intrinsically irrational, that they're about different stakeholders vying for control over resources competitively and not actually trying to do what's best for society, um, or that people are completely oblivious to reason or analysis. This has not been my experience of policymakers. Um, my experience is primarily in the British political system where, uh, so I can't necessarily speak outside of that, but I tend to meet 
well-intentioned, smart people who are trying to make their country better off and do so respecting evidence and working within the constraints of the system that they're working in. So I, I don't think that it's like not tractable because people ignore reason. It also doesn't follow from people ignoring reason that you can't persuade people or create change. You just need to adopt different strategies. Uh, so I, I don't think this would be an argument to not engage in policy. What might be more concerning, actually, is if you model the policy-making process as extremely rational and also very heavily resourced. Because then you might think, OK, let's look in the whole space of policies that haven't happened yet and think about just the subset of ones that are tractable, where you could get them to happen, and then look for the subset of those where like, you've got really, really good reasons to definitely think that they're good policies and you're not going to regret doing this. And then you've got to ask yourself the question, why have they not already happened? Maybe you can get in there faster than anybody else, and you can find them, and you can push them along. But maybe you're just speeding the process up by a year or so. So in a really functional policy system, um, really, really functional, perfectly rational, heavily resourced, you'd expect marginal policy work to be pointless. And so the, the story that we need to have for thinking that policy might be tractable um, happens to, I think, look a lot like the real world which is that, by and large, policymakers are trying to do the best they can with the information they have. Uh, they don't have perfect information. They have limited teams. They can't explore all of the options on the table. The civil society around them are not exploring all of the options on the table either because they have limited budgets. Some areas are well-resourced. Some areas are not well-resourced. Sometimes you can improve a policy a lot by pointing out something quite basic that the people making the decision knew about but just didn't sort of come up while they were thinking about it because they have so many other things on their plate. Um, and that's a kind of, that's a story which resonates a lot with my personal experience of how the process seems to go, which suggests that marginal resources on the most important policy issues can make quite a big difference because you can just improve the quality of analysis um, and improve the ability of well-intentioned people to do good things. Um, and because I think that we live in a world that's a bit more like that than any of the others, I think that it, policy is comparatively tractable. Although clearly there are parts of it that aren't very tractable, and there are parts of it that are. So really totemic issues that are sort of big political platforms on both sides are probably not very tractable because the you know, two parties are just sort of locked antlers and are pushing at each other and nothing's going to happen. Um, but I think there are lots of areas where that's not true. Uh, I'll move quickly through this one because it's, it's not something that I tend to get from EAs, although I get it a lot from policymakers, uh, which is that you know, policymakers are decent people doing a good job and they sort of know what they're doing. And again, I'm sorry about the formatting. Um, I think there are some differences between the EA mindset and what policymakers, even you know, the really well-intentioned ones, do by default. Uh, I think we tend to have a longer-term view we tend to look more for scope and sensitivity. So this is going back to the exercise that I did in the first couple of slides, where I sort of looked for you know, these orders of magnitude difference. Um, this is a really, I think this is an important effect of altruist reflex to think about, you know, this effect is 10 or 100 times more important than this other effect, so let's focus on this one, is not a thing that I think uh, policymakers tend to do by default, because their attention is sort of pulled to the more uh, often media salient things or just the things that are crossing their desk on the day. Um, and they don't have the space, the mental space, to step back and reprioritize. Uh, we tend to be a bit more internationalist because we think that people sort of across the world are equally valuable, uh, which some policymakers believe, some don't, but the structural incentives of most democracies don't necessarily reflect that position. Um, we tend to be more focused on sort of aggregate total well-being as a measure of sort of how good things are. And we tend to emphasize looking for disconfirming evidence more. So I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had with you know, people who do strategy work at departments and say, yeah, the process is, the minister says, we should look into this, go find evidence that this works. And then they go away and find evidence that it works, and they come back and bring it to the minister, and everyone says, great. Uh, but no one checks to look for evidence that it wouldn't work. Um, and so this is like a major EA emphasis, and I think that's valuable. So I think these point to where the EA comparative advantages are. And not on this list are like being smarter 
or being better able to do math or something like that, because that's just not, you know, that's not our, and maybe there are individual EAs who are smart and able to do math, but that's not what the community brings. Rather, what the community brings, I think, is this long-term view, this reflex of looking over orders of magnitudes, taking a step back and prioritizing, being internationalist, thinking about people's well-being and sort of the aggregate well-being, and looking for disconfirming evidence as opposed to just evidence for a policy. Then this last point is that um, there's this chance that effective altruism's brand is damaged by engaging too much in policy or politics. And I think there are two main mechanisms for this. One is uh, if we become associated with a standard political movement or political party, it could shape future recruitment into the movement. And I think that might be bad because it might lead to effective altruism just getting subsumed into an existing political movement and losing a lot of what makes it distinctive and special. And I think that that would be a shame. Uh, certainly in my community, I'm aware of lots of people on both the left and right who are attracted to different parts of effective altruism because the message of sort of trying to make the world better using evidence and analysis isn't a very partisan one. Um, but I think there is a risk of that kind of a development, particularly if it happens to be that we do evidence and analysis and find that one party is right more often than another. It could easily create an impression of political bias even where we're not trying to have something like that. The other is um, that politics can be tribal and it could be quite easy to put people off by proposing a particular policy that is anathema to one political tribe and that an individual EA meaning well by pushing for a policy that creates a backlash could really hurt the movement as a whole. And so I think it's really important for effective altruists who do want to go into policy to be quite responsible in how they approach it and to get lots of input from other parts of the movement before advocating any particular policies too strongly um, because there is the potential for that backlash effect and sort of contagion, which I think would be re a real shame. Um, so this takes us back to my sort of my main three things that I think we probably should be doing in policy. Uh, one, I think, I think we should be doing policy. All of the reasons that I gave at the start for how huge a deal this is still hold. And I think all of the reasons to avoid it more tell you what kinds of policy work to avoid rather than telling you to avoid just engaging in this way that the world distributes roughly half its resources with a little bit less. Um, one is to be uncertain. I think we really, I can't emphasize this enough, it would be a real shame to start pushing policies that turn out to hurt people. And it's a really live option. A lot of policies do. And so it's important to be cautious about expressing how confident we are in different policies and to really test ourselves and try to find reasons why the policies we think are good uh, might not be, because we need to remember lots of the things we think are good might not be. Um, to avoid being political, this one I'm conflicted about. It might be the case that the best way to have impact would be to ally ourselves with one political party and to sort of take advantage of an existing distribution mechanism for political insights. Um, I think the costs significantly outweigh the benefits, partly because of this tribalism that I was talking about it earlier, which also makes it harder to, in a detached way, evaluate policy, um, which might hurt our objectivity and ability to actually work out which policies are best. And last, and this I also want to emphasize a lot, to not assume that the thing that we bring is like, oh, now we finally have smart people looking at this, so we'll crack it, because that's just not the case, but rather think about what's actually special about effective altruism and effective altruists, what we can bring to these conversations, and to tailor our work towards those things. Um, but like I say, I think there are pros and cons to all of these. I'm up for discussing them. Uh, I was going to do a little bit of a Q&A now with some questions from the floor. Um, I also will be over in the, the poly, the other one, um, ballroom afterwards to have conversation with any of you who want to. We also have sort of special guest, Richard Parr, former advisor to David Cameron, UK's Prime Minister. 
up at the front, very happy to talk to people, answer their questions, give them pointers about how to engage in policy. Uh, I can't tell you how much I valued his advice um, and definitely recommend the opportunity to have a chat with him. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, question at the front. I'm Alan Fennick from SCI. Hi. Uh, I wonder if I could give you an example. Oh, there's a... Yeah, sure. <laughs> I wonder if I could... I wonder if I could give you an example which would strongly recommend that you should do policies. Absolutely. Ten years ago, uh, the British government did not have any funding going to neglected tropical diseases, and neither did the US government. There was also not an effective altruism movement. But a group of us who were very passionate about NTDs were basically effective altruists, and we went and policy uh, almost demanded, if you like, an audience and were mani managed to put over uh, the change in policy that both the American government and the British government should support neglected tropical diseases. Yes, their policy makers were very bright and knew everything, but they didn't know anything about neglected tropical diseases. So it is what you pick to fight. Now, today, the United States government has over $450 million going into the control of neglected tropical diseases, and the British government, 240 million pounds going into neglected tropical diseases. If we hadn't had that sort of altruism and that sort of policy argument, today, even the, uh, the, or, the uh, organizations that you support wouldn't exist. Uh, and it's because of those uh, large amounts of money that both USAID and DFID have to spend that we're able to now go to GiveWell and to uh, other organizations to get extra support. And finally, so my point is pick the right thing to fight uh, and then you should be going into policy and I'd love to have a copy of those first four slides if you wouldn't mind for teaching purposes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I think that's an incredibly good case study, a really, really good example, uh, because it highlights this thing, you know, the, the policymakers at DFID were receptive, in the end at least, I don't know how much you needed to struggle, but, um, <laughs> but you know, it is possible to change minds there and for, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of funding to move as a result. But equally, they're not all-knowing and all-informed, and marginal effort to inform people and to bring policy options and considerations to the table that they weren't aware of can have this huge impact. So it's this sort of uh, both respecting them enough to engage with them properly and also understanding their, the limitations of their position so that you can bring new ideas and new things to them, I think is just very powerful. Um, yes? Uh, You'll need to, ah, one last question. You'll need to yell loudly, though. Okay, um, so you, you talked about the funding, the opportunity to influence developed countries like DFID, but even bigger amounts of money are being spent on anti-poverty programs by developing country governments. Um, where, and you didn't talk about the potential for influencing those. And a slight plug that some of the people who are doing that work are talking tomorrow about how to influence Fantastic. Yeah. It was an oversight on my part because of the particular nature of the environment that I'm in. But absolutely right. Absolutely right. I don't know if everybody heard that. This was the point that uh, developing country governments, not just developed country governments, spend an enormous amount of money on really important things and that engaging with them is incredibly valuable and that there is a panel or a talk tomorrow of people who are exploring exactly that question, um, which sounds fantastic. Thank you very much, and I'll be over there for more questions later. <laughs>